This video is going to get you through the special uh, census lab. It starts on page 207 in the lab manual. Um, it actually starts talking about stuff, though, on the next page, page 208. So that's where we're going to start. So special senses, these are the ones they usually teach you about when you're in like elementary school. And so just a refresher, vision, that's your eyes job. Visual information comes from light. Light travels as both a wave and a discrete particle. Your retina is going to be detecting wavelengths of light as color information. So different wavelengths equal different colors. Hearing, that's a sound vibration. So it's still a wavelength thing, but because it doesn't have the particle that's associated with it, it's only gonna be detected by these special cells called hair cells in the ear, uh, specifically in something called the cochlea. Equilibrium is also part of the ear. You have a couple of little structures that help to tell you if you're like laying down on your back or if you're spinning towards your right. And so your equilibrium relates to balance and which direction you might be turning. Smell and taste are both going to be detecting chemicals. It's just a matter of where are the chemicals. If they're in your nasal cavity, you're going to smell them. And if they're in your oral cavity, you're going to taste them. But essentially, they really do work the same way. We're going to be talking about the eye in more detail. So this is just a picture that is very similar to the one that you have in your lab manual. The stuff that you need to know about the eye are that there's three basic layers that help to make the eye up. You have the fibrous layer, the vascular layer, and the sensory layer. The fibrous layer has two parts. That's the cornea, which is this structure right here. The cornea is sometimes called the window to the eye. It is clear. It is avascular. That means there are no blood vessels in the cornea. What it's going to do is just allow light to pass directly through it. Then the back part of the fibrous layer is the white of the eye, and that's the sclera. So both of those help to make up the fibrous layer. Now the sclera's job is to really help maintain the shape of the eye and just help protect the eye itself. Next, we're going to talk about the vascular layer. Most of the vascular layer is the choroid. It has the blood vessels that are going to nourish the sclera and nourish the retina, which really don't have their own blood vessels at least not over their whole length. Towards the front, the choroid is going to thicken and develop some muscle. And so all of this stuff going right through here, this all makes up the ciliary body. The ciliary body is attached via suspensory ligaments to the lens, and that's going to help to control where your light is being focused. So your ciliary body is also part of the vascular layer as is the iris, which is the colored part of your eye. Like I have blue eyes, so my iris is blue. Where's iris? There it is. So all of those make up the vascular layer. The last part is the sensory layer, and the sensory layer is where you're actually going to have your photoreceptors that are going to detect light, and that is going to be in the retina, which is this yellow layer. They've kind of cut it through there, but more there and then more up over there. So your retina is the sensory layer that contains the rods and cones. Rods are responsible for black and white vision, and they are very sensitive to light. So even if there's just a tiny amount of light, like you feel like you're in a pitch black room, you're really not. There's a light someplace in there, even if it's just like a clock radio. Your rods are going to be able to detect that. Cones, on the other hand, need to have bright light in order to work but they can differentiate different wavelengths. And most of the cones of your eye are found in this little structure, go away box, which is called the fovea centralis, which in Latin just means central focal point. So that's where the lens is supposed to be focusing the image so that you can see it the best. Now the lens itself, this is what's going to help do the focusing for your eye. You can change the shape of it by pulling on it with the ciliary body. Um, depending on how you pull it and which way you kind of flatten it, that helps you see things that are far away or see things that are up close. And so your lens is what really has to do a lot of the work to help you focus that light. Now also in the middle and kind of hard to see, kind of hard to point to because it's a hole, this little area right here is the pupil. The pupil also can change size based on the iris. So if the iris opens up, the pupil gets bigger. And if the iris closes down, the pupil gets smaller. That is usually done in response to how much light is available to the eyes. If there's a lot of light, the pupil will be really small. And if there's a darker room that you're in, the pupil is going to be fairly large, although there are other things that can play a role in there. Now, the lens itself separates the eye into the anterior segment and the front. So all of this is anterior. And then the posterior segment is everything behind the lens. 
there's two different fluids that you can find in each one of those parts. The anterior segment is filled with aqueous humor, and you make more of that every day. It comes up and it drains out, and as long as we're maintaining homeostasis, life is good there. The back part of the eye, though, has vitreous humor, and vitreous means like thick and sticky, and it's kind of got... Imagine grape jelly, but clear. That's what vitreous humor feels like. And you do not make more of that. You're born with all you're ever going to have of it. And if you were to sustain damage to your eye and that leaks out, you can't repair that. You'd have to go in to have surgery. And quite frankly, you're probably just going to lose vision in your eye if you do lose that vitreous humor. What that humor does is it helps to shove the retina back up against the choroid so that it doesn't slip. If you lose the vitreous humor, you lose that pressure, and that's when the retina can just kind of fall away from the choroid, which means it falls away from its blood supply. That's called retinal detachment, and that can actually kill the retina because now it's not getting the oxygen and nutrients and things that it's supposed to have. So you need that vitreous humor to be in there. Now, a couple of other little things. All of the rods and cones are going to have axons that it's going, they're going to be sending off, and those axons are all going to merge together to make the optic nerve. The optic nerve is going to take that visual information to the brain so that the brain can process it. But there's a place at the back of the eye where all, go away box, where all of those axons are emerging from. And there are no rods and cones in that place because all the axons are passing through it. And so this is a place where you cannot detect it. It is a blind spot. All of the light that hits that area, you can't see it. Your brain fills it in with what it thinks is supposed to be there. And we're going to kind of come back and talk about the relevance of that later on. But that is your anatomical blind spot. And the reason it's the blind spot is there are no rods and cones in that spot. Now, if we were in the classroom, you would have to take all of those things that we just talked about and apply them to an eye model like this one in the picture. This person is holding the lens for the eye. It would have been sitting right here, but we've pulled it out. This is the iris, this is the sclera, the cornea is missing from this model, but it would have been kind of bulging out in front of the iris there. Um, this red layer going on right here, that would be the choroid. And then I always really hate how the models do this. Um, sometimes they want this clear part back here to be the retina. And sometimes they want this yellow part to be the retina. It always just kind of depends on which model you have, what they want. But inside of that clear bubble in the back there, that would be your vitreous humor. Um, that's really all you can see from this model, except you can see a little bit of the bulge of the ciliary body going on right there and right there. That would have controlled the lens for the eye so that you could focus the light. But... Y'all don't really get to see the models up close in it. I would I would really probably not show this picture on a lab quiz because it's just so much easier to do it with one of the actual pictures that come from either the lab manual or a different textbook. All right, these things I already mentioned earlier, but just to kind of reiterate, underneath the picture, it talks about the importance of the rods and cones. These are your photoreceptors, which means they are what actually detect the wavelengths of light. You've got rods over the entire surface of the retina. Um, they don't give you very clear vision. They give you sort of a blurry vision, but they again work very well even in dim light. Cones, on the other hand, give you very crisp, clear vision. When you can see things really clearly, it's the cones that are doing that for you, but they have to have bright light in order to work. There are other advantages that usually they can detect different wavelengths, and so you can see different colors because of cones. Um, the lab manual starts to talk about some of the disorders that can happen in relation to the eye um, and some of the different parts that I mentioned earlier. So glaucoma is a buildup of the aqueous humor in the anterior chamber of the eye. I mentioned earlier, you make more of that fluid every day and it's supposed to be drained out. If the canal that it gets drained from gets occluded somehow or it gets damaged, that fluid can't escape anymore but you'll keep making more aqueous humor. What that's going to do is start to shove the lens backwards. That's going to increase pressure in the posterior chamber of your eye and actually put so much pressure on the retina that it's going to start to kill the retina. So glaucoma is a reason that a person can go blind. It is typically seen in more older people, although it can strike younger people as well. Um, if you go into the eye doctor and they do that puff test where they tell you not to blink and then they puff air into your eye, that test is done to 
to detect glaucoma. Um, if we catch it early, we can treat you so that you're basically just going to be doing eye drops all the time, and those eye drops will help keep the pressure in your eye reduced. But if you don't catch it, you will go blind, and so that's why you want to make sure you're going in for routine eye exams. Um, next step, the next thing that's kind of discussed, I've lost my pointer so that I can make that go away, erase all ink. Oh, it doesn't even know there's ink on this slide. Well, that's just going to bother me. Ooh, looky, I didn't even know I had that ability. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I discovered something new. I'm excited about it. Okay, so the lens. Ordinarily, you can't see the lens, but one of the things that goes along with getting older is your lens is more likely to become cloudy. When your lens gets cloudy, that's characteristic of a cataract, and so that's what this person has right here. This is really easy to treat. Doctors do cataract surgery all the time, and 95% of the time, those cataract surgeries are remarkably successful. That said, there can be some problems that do happen sometimes, but those are fairly rare side effects that happen. So cataract, it's a fairly quick surgery. They just go in, they vacuum out the old lens, and they pop in a new lens, and then you can see clearly before. Imagine just everything, not just being blurry, but just the world looking foggy all the time. And that's what cataracts looks like, is everything is just kind of foggy all the time. Uh, let's see, accommodation is the process that your eyes have to go through to focus on things that are up close. Essentially, our eyes were built to see things that were 20 feet away or farther. So if we want to look at things that are closer than that, we have to do things to our eyes in order to see those things that are closer. Most notably, what we have to do is we have to change the shape of the lens so that the lens can focus the light directly onto the fovea centralis. That there's a bunch of really weird things that are happening right now. So because of technology, we are now staring at things that are closer to our face for longer periods of time. And so we are starting to see more people that are nearsighted when historically, from an evolutionary standpoint, that's not the way our eyes were built to see. There's a disadvantage to being nearsighted, and that is you don't see the predator in the grass that's far away that's thinking about eating you. Um, which, yes, we're kind of removed from that at this point, too. But our eyes were built to see things far away to keep us safe when we lived in a predator-prey relationship with things like wolves and bears and, I don't know, whatever else, lions and tigers that are out there. Um, one of the other things that gets sucky about getting older is not only can your lens become cloudy, it become, becomes a lot more difficult for you to change the shape of it. So when you can't accommodate anymore, you lose that ability to see things that are up close. That is what presbyopia is, and most older people are going to suffer from that. Now, while most of my students in this class are fairly young, there's probably a couple of people that are older and they're already starting to have to like hold books far away from their face. Or maybe you just go out to restaurants with your parents and they have to hold the menu far away. That means they're suffering from presbyopia and it's time for them to go get some glasses so they can focus on things that are up close. Other problems. People who are myopic are nearsighted. That means they can see things up close, but not see things that are far away. They would need glasses in order to see things that are far away. Um, just some weird terms. Your lab manual doesn't mention emetropic, but an emetropic eye is a normal eye that sees 20-20 vision. Now, what 20-20 means is you can see a size 20 letter from 20 feet away. If you're myopic, that would be more like your 20-30, 20-40, 20-50, something like that. It means you are having to, you, what a normal person can see that is 20 feet away, you have to be a lot closer to it in order to be able to see it. Hyperopic is the exact opposite. This would be a person who is farsighted, so you can see things that are far away but have distant uh, problems with things that are up close. Um, once again, there are lenses to help correct for this, and this is how eyes used to be built, essentially, is so that you could see things that are farther away. But again, there's glasses to fix that. Astigmatism is one word. I know that when I was younger, um, I always thought it was astigmatism, but no, it's the condition of astigmatism. When you have astigmatism, it means that your eye is not as round as it's supposed to be, and it means you're going to either be hyperopic or myopic. It just depends on how your eye is curving abnormally as to which one of these you're going to have. What it really means for you, though, is when you get glasses or contacts, they have to be ground down specifically for your funky-shaped eyeball, and as a result, it's going to be more expensive for you to get those things. But it still just means you have problems with your vision. 
One of the ways that eye doctors can tell whether or not you have problems with your vision is with the Snell and Eye chart. If you've been to any eye doctor, you have seen something sort of like this. And what they want you to do is read the smallest size line that you can read from wherever you're sitting. Now, in the standard form, you would be standing 20 feet away from this, and you would read whatever is the smallest line. Um, it, you can't really just print this off because it has to be the correct size in order to read it, and you have to know how far away you're supposed to stand from it. But the basic highlight is if you haven't gone to an eye doctor recently, you're still supposed to go once a year just for the health of your eye. It's not even necessarily about vision. It's are you already developing glaucoma and you might need to get those eye drops I was talking about earlier. Do you have um, a cataract that's starting to develop? Do you have some other medical problem with your eye, like there's floaters in there that can potentially get in the way as you're driving or just whatever? There's a bunch of other things that can go on with the eye. But this tells them what kind of lens you would need if you're going to be getting corrective eyewear. A blind spot test. There's a little thing for you guys to actually do that relates to this. It's on page 214 in your lab manual so that you can do this. But honestly, I like some of the ones that you can find online a little bit better. If you just Google blind spot test, you'll be able to find some of these. If you follow the instructions in your lab manual, what you will notice as you look at this one right here, like if you're looking at this plus sign and you're covering up an eye and you're pulling it closer to your face, there's going to come a point where you cannot see this yellow circle over here because the yellow circle would be in the blind spot of your eye. Because your brain dislikes having a blind spot, your brain fills it in with what it thinks is supposed to be there. And what it's doing is it's following the pattern. And in this case, it would fill in that yellow circle with a red circle because that was what was happening around it. So your brain just assumed that was supposed to be a red circle. Um, you could do the same thing with the other eye, but you have to flip the image over. Basically, if you just Google blind spot test and do whatever the website says, you should be able to see your blind spot for yourself. You can also do what the lab manual says and you'll see it that way. But the reason why I want you to see your blind spot is because I want you to know that what you see is not necessarily 100% real. Sometimes your brain fills in information just to make your brain happy. It's filling in a pattern. The reason why I think that that's an important thing to understand is because eyewitnesses are used all the time in trials and eyewitnesses will put people behind bars even though you're relying on information that may not be accurate because your brain will try to make sense of things that don't make sense and it will fill it in with fake information. And that's what the blind spot test can show you, the fake information that your brain's trying to tell you just to make your brain happy. And so I know it might seem like that's quite a leap to get there, but it's very important that you understand eyewitnesses send people to jail all the time who shouldn't go to jail because their brain made stuff up. All right, after the eye, we start to talk about the ear. Different parts of the ear. We've got three different chunks to it, the external, the middle, and the internal ear. Your external ear is really just designed to funnel sound towards the middle ear. Your middle ear is designed to amplify sound. It does that by shaking different parts. Your tympanic membrane is your eardrum. It vibrates in response to sound. That vibration makes these three bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, vibrate. They shake something called the oval window, which is right underneath the stapes, and then that vibration starts to move this fluid called paralymph that's in your cochlea. It starts to make it oscillate back and forth, and then you're going to detect that oscillation of the fluid in there. So this is amplifying that vibration so that the inner ear is going to be able to actually detect it. So we funnel in the outer ear, we amplify in the middle ear, and then we detect in the inner ear. Now the inner ear has three components that aren't labeled on this picture, but they are in your lab manual. The cochlea is this snail shell looking thing. That is where your hearing receptors are. They're called hair cells. They're in something called the organ of corti. The hair cells vibrate as that fluid oscillates back and forth. And then they send that vibratory information through this nerve right here, which is called the vestibulocochlear nerve. They send it to the brain so that the brain can process that information. 
You've got semicircular canals. These help to tell you whether or not you're spinning, so these are part of the equilibrium part of the ear. The vestibule tells you the position of your head, like are you upright, are you laying down, are you on your right side? Your vestibule knows that information, so this is another equilibrium part to the ear. The equilibrium part is also being sent through the vestibulocochlear nerve to the ear. Your lab manual calls this tube the eustachian tube. Most um, ear, nose, and throat doctors are going to call it that too. This book is trying to change the name to pharyngotympanic tube, so just don't worry about that. It's the eustachian tube is what they called it for you. And then in your lab manual, this is called the external auditory canal instead of this word, so call it what your lab manual does. Um, a little side note that I always like to make here. Your lab manual calls this a pinna. A pinna is like a floppy ear, like what a dog has. You don't have a floppy ear, so you don't really have a pinna. You have an oracle. A, an oracle is a more rigid structure that has some helical aspects to it. That would be like this little part right here. And so that's what you have as an oracle. Dogs have a pinna, elephants have a pinna, but you have an oracle. Now, ordinarily, we take the information from the picture and we apply it to a model again. Um, the only note that I really have to make here is, again, that pinna should really be called an oracle. Um, this is the external auditory canal, um, tympanic membrane. You can see the malleus, the incus, and the stapes are sort of hiding in this picture. This should be the eustachian tube, not an auditory tube. You can see the cochlea and the semicircular canals. You can't see the vestibule there. Um, motion sickness is described just a little bit on page, what is it, 216, I believe. And for this one, I've got a little video to show you if I can lose that. Okay, here's your video. Erase, erase, erase. Whew, that would have been an embarrassing way to start a video. Okay, so what did I decide to read a book in the back seat? But after only moments of reading, you start feeling dizzy, fatigued, and nauseous. Sounds like motion sickness. The surprising truth is that about 30% of the population experiences motion sickness, with over 66% of people experiencing it in extreme conditions. This happens when your eyes and inner ear are sending different signals to the brain. The vestibular system inside your ear contributes to balance and spatial orientation. Tiny hairs inside the canal detect the movement of a fluid inside it, allowing you to orient yourself. If you lean to the side, the fluid moves and signals are sent to your brain to help you understand this. But oftentimes, in a car, on a boat, or in the IMAX theater, your vestibular system is transmitting a different signal from your other senses. In the case of your car, your eyes see that everything in the car is seemingly stationary, particularly when you stare at a book but your ears feel the movement of the car. Conversely, in the IMAX theater, your eyes see a lot of motion while your ear is experiencing very little movement at all. This mismatch of signals tells the brain something's wrong. So why does it induce vomiting? The leading theory suggests that, evolutionarily, if the input signals from your ears and eyes weren't matching, you'd likely ingested a neurotoxin. The easiest way to get rid of it? Throw it up. This all right, so that basically summarizes what I needed you guys to know about motion sickness. It's a conflict of information between your eyes and your ears and anytime your brain is getting two different sets of information it gets very unhappy and its solution is to make you very unhappy and so that's what's going on there um, vertigo is discussed just a little bit next a lot of people confuse vertigo with dizziness vertigo is you feel like you're moving even though you're not like you could just be laying in bed but you feel like you're falling that's vertigo Smell is discussed just a little bit. Smell is also called olfaction. You have chemoreceptors up in the top of your nasal cavity and they will detect the shape of a molecule and then release different neurotransmitters at different rates to, for each of those shapes and that's how you can differentiate between like the smell of a rose and the smell of a skunk. That information is going to travel through the olfactory nerve which is actually cranial nerve number one to the brain. Taste. There are five basic tastes that we know of. Like I said, up here there are probably more than this, but these are the ones that we know of. Um, your taste buds are on your tongue, and taste and smell are actually very intimately um, associated with each other. 
that's something I'm going to come back to a little bit later on. You do have a little picture in your lab manual at the bottom of page 216 that kind of tries to show you how smell works and then another one on the top of page 217 that gives you sort of the anatomy of the taste bud. But they're both just detecting chemicals and the shape of those chemicals. Um, just some questions for me. So tympanic membrane is the eardrum. That would be number 50. That thing by the red arrow is the cochlea, so that's the part that actually does the hearing. A way side note before we get to the questions that are in your book. Um, for some people who are born with certain types of deafness, we can give them a cochlear implant that will allow them to be able to hear again. Um, that is what's happening for this little girl, and this x-ray actually shows you all of the different things that are implanted under her skin, through her jaw, like it's a very complicated machine and it's a very intensive surgery to give a person a cochlear implant. Um, here's the thing that I always prefer to mention when it comes to this. Um, there's a video that's out there, you guys could search for it if you really wanted to. Um, it's titled, Woman Hears for the First Time. This woman is actually from Burleson, and I am super, I have been super annoyed with the name of her video forever. And the reason is, she's not hearing for the first time. If you were hearing for the first time, you would not be able to magically speak and understand English, because think about how long it took you to understand what all the sounds meant and how to put them together to make words, and how to put words together to make sentences which make thoughts you're not just gonna magically be able to understand everything that's spoken just because you can suddenly hear. She already could hear a little bit, but had lost her hearing significantly. This implant helps her hear much better, but she was not hearing for the first time. And it's very important that people understand if a cochlear implant is something that's gonna happen for a family member or for themselves, that you don't just magically gain the ability to speak English. Why I'm telling you this is, A, so that you don't go in with expectations that can't be met, but B, that you need to understand it's better to get a cochlear implant when you're very young, when your language skills are still primed for development, versus when you're older and it's more difficult to learn a language. And so it's always better to get this surgery very early so that they won't be as developmentally behind if they choose to do that. That said, just because a person's deaf doesn't mean they have to have a cochlear implant. The deaf community, some of them would prefer to stay deaf. They like it that way. They can speak through sign language to other people. There's different kinds of sign language in different places, and that's just part of their community, and hearing is sort of seen as um, a cheater's way out. And so it's a personal choice as to whether or not a person wants to get a cochlear implant if they're deaf. All right, after that, you get to the questions that are actually in the lab manual. The picture at the bottom of page two, uh, 217 goes with the table at the top of page 218. Pause the video and get the answers to the questions that you need. Um, next, this one, the picture is on 218. The table is on page 219. Again, pause the video, get what you need. We've really already talked about all of that. These are pretty self-explanatory, and I really talked about all of these things as we were going through there, and so just get what you need. Some of these questions do also continue on to page 220. Um, number nine, I did want to talk about that really briefly. Um, accommodation is something that is different for everybody. Um, and it kind of goes along with just how good your eyes are. Are you myopic? Are you hyperopic? Are you emetropic? Do you have presbyopia? Do you have astigmatism? Whatever. All of those things play a role there. If you happen to have a yardstick or a meter stick that is available to you, you can test how old your eyes are sort of by measuring your accommodation rate. And what you would do is hold the meter stick up against your chin and then hold like a piece of paper, or I think the thing says a pen or whatever, as far away from your chin as you can and move it closer with one eye closed. And then there's gonna be a point where it gets blurry. Not that you can't see it, it's just blurry. That point is your near point of vision. And once you have that, you can look at your near point of vision and compare it to the little chart that they have given you to see sort of how old your eyes are. Um, and so that's something that everybody could do on their own, but you really kind of have to have a meter stick in order to do that, or a yardstick if you happen to have that. Or I guess most, most households have a tape measure, so if you could make that flat away from your chin, you could do it with a tape measure or two. 
Number 10, um, list all the structures that sound waves have to pass through. You can just pause the video to get it. Number 11, I have to assume that they wanted to ask about light waves at this point because they threw the word seen in at one point, but then it talked about signed sound waves and words. So I'm saying there's typos in here and they meant light waves and seen as opposed to sounds. So this is the light, the, uh, the pathway that light travels through as it goes through your eye. After that, critical thinking questions. A cataract results from a cloudy lens. Light rays don't reach the retina properly and the lens must be removed. How can a person's eye now focus properly? Well, when they remove your cloudy lens, they put in a new lens. There are a bunch of videos on YouTube. If you can stomach it, watch some of those videos. They're really cool. Um, they just jab a scalpel into the cornea and then they suck out the old lens and then they fold up a new lens and they pop it into the eye and unfold it. It's, it's amazing what they can do with the eye. Um, it's even a no stitch procedure and you don't bleed very much because your cornea is avascular. And so the only thing that bleeds is the conjunctiva, which is a little sheet of tissue right on the surface of the eye. Um, but yeah, it's, I recommend you watch one of those videos. It's really cool. Uh, number two, glaucoma is a disease where there's excess pressure in the eyeball. How does this affect the retina? Well, it shoves the retina back against the choroid and will actually shut off that blood flow. So like I said here, it's going to kill the retina. And I kind of already said that earlier too. Number three, what role do the senses play in homeostasis? Well, part of homeostasis is reception of information and then processing that information in the brain and then responding to it. Well, that information can also come from your special senses. Like if you were to eat a funky food that maybe had some bacterial contamination to it, your taste buds could tell you, this is funky, you shouldn't eat this. Because if you were to eat it, you would probably end up with diarrhea or vomiting and you wouldn't want to do that. And so they're just receiving some kind of stimuli so that you can react to that. Um, light the same way so that you can see if there's a car coming that's about to hit you or you can see if there's a cat coming who's about to sneeze in your face or, you know, whatever. Uh, number four, how does the brain distinguish one smell from another? It all works off the shape of a molecule. Neurons are also super complicated. They can release different neurotransmitters at different times depending on the frequency of the action potentials that are being received. We don't really talk about the nervous system in lecture or lab for that matter, and so that gets really above where we need it to be. So just kind of know it's about the shape of the molecule. Number five, how does LASIK work for myopia and hyperopia? So LASIK is laser eye surgery. What they do is they use the laser, laser to reshape the lens of the eye so that it can focus the light more efficiently onto the fovea centralis. And again, there's videos online of doctors trying to explain that. If you want to go watch any of those, they can be educational if you're considering that procedure. Um, LASIK is something that if you want to get the maximum benefit, you have to do it after you have completely stopped growing. So that's, you know, when you're in your early 20s. Um, doing it in your early 20s will also get you the most time with like perfect 2020 vision because once you start to hit 40, your eyes are going to start to have problems again. And so if you wait until you're 35 to get LASIK, you only get five years of good vision. So doing it sooner means you get a longer period of time that you don't need glasses or contacts. Uh, number six, how do the senses of taste and smell work together? I told you earlier I was going to come back to this. So again, there's some interesting videos that you can find on YouTube that kind of talk about this, but smell is directly related to taste. Essentially, you smell your food before you taste your food. And if your food smells, again, sort of funky, that is going to give you a direct impact on the taste of that food. One of the foods that's out there that some people consider to be a wonderful food and delicacy but other people can't get past the smell of it to eat it is something called a durian fruit. I have never been in the presence of a durian fruit, but what I have been told is if you were to take like a dude's nasty gym socks and leave them in a gym bag and not wash them for a week with a block of blue cheese in the gym bag to um, come back in a week and take a whiff of the inside of that gym bag, that's supposedly what a durian fruit smells like. So super duper funky, but it supposedly tastes amazing. 
But because taste and smell work together to give you a complete picture of the food, most people can't get past the smell of the durian fruit, even though it supposedly tastes amazing. And so they really are very intimately connected. I'll also give you a story um, from a student. She has, uh, well, she had COVID. As a result of having COVID, she lost her sense of smell. Because taste and smell are intimately connected, what that did was it also altered how all of her foods tasted. COVID doesn't hurt your taste buds at all, but it does hurt your sense of smell. She specifically told me that she can't eat ice cream anymore because it doesn't have a taste anymore because part of that, again, goes back to smell. And now the texture of it is too weird. And so it just... We don't really know for sure. It seems to be like an 80%, 20% sort of a mixture of those two things, but we know they are tied to each other. Um, and then last, number seven, what happens to your hearing ability if you are continually exposed to loud noises like gunshots, loud music, and so on? Okay, so for this, there's a little structure inside the cochlea. It's called the organ of corti. It's right here. The organ of corti has these specialized little cells on them called hair cells. If those hairs fold over as a result of sound vibrations, these cells fire off an impulse and tell the brain, hey, I hear a sound. If you listen to a very loud sound, what that does is it folds those hairs over so hard that they don't bounce back up like they're supposed to. And so as a result of those hair cells being folded down as a result of that loud sound, this cell keeps firing off an impulse saying, hey, I hear a sound, I hear a sound, I hear a sound. And your brain gets really annoyed by hearing that same sound over and over and over again. So eventually your brain goes, just shut up. I don't want to listen to you anymore. And it stops paying attention to that cell. And now you can't hear that sound anymore, which it's kind of like a note. You can't hear a note. Probably you guys have seen some of the apps that are out there that will make really high-pitched sounds so that they will annoy teenagers, but older people can't hear them. Well, that's because all of the hair cells towards the front of the ear, they get damaged as we've gone through life. So people that are my age, all of those hair cells have been turned off by the brain because they got tired of hearing those sounds all the time. That keeps happening the more you listen to loud sounds. So for any of you that like to drive around and force everybody else to listen to your music that you love so much, you are not going to be able to hear your music that you love so much if you keep doing that because your brain's going to just start shutting off those cells in your ear because it gets tired of hearing them. Here's the other thing that you are going to need to know. If you hear those loud sounds a lot, you might also suffer from something called tinnitus. Tinnitus is a ringing in your ears and an absence of auditory stimuli. And otherwise, in other words, your ears are making your brain think there's a sound when there is no sound there. So imagine just hearing like a phone ringing in your ear all the time. You can't shut it off. You can't make it go away. You're trying to go to sleep at night, but that stupid ringing is still there. That's what tinnitus is. And that is a direct result of you listening to music too loud or firing guns without hearing protection. And if you've ever talked to anybody who has tinnitus, I have never heard anybody say anything good about it. It's always like, it, it makes me unable to fall asleep or it's, it's made me suicidal. I have heard people say they're suicidal as a result of the ringing in their ears. And so please protect your hearing. You can't get it back once you lose it. And so just protect it once you got it. Um, once you're done with this, you should be pretty much ready to take your um, post-lab quiz on special senses.